Okay, wonderful. So we are live and we're joined by Christopher Morrow of Algernon Pharmaceuticals, David Nutt, an advisor to the company, and Cindy, Cindy Edwards, who's going to be hosting this panel. Cindy, I'm going to let you take it away from here. Thanks for okay. joining. Okay. Oh, it's, it's our pleasure to be here. Love that we have an international audience watching and, and love this space, learning so much and about the potential of psychedelics. Now, Chris, Moreau is the CEO of Algernon, and your company is hoping to help stroke patients with DMT, dimethyltryptamine. So explain the two types of stroke that can occur and which of the two Algernon is hoping to treat. Well, well, there are, there are two types of stroke. Uh, there's an ischemic stroke where there's a blockage of the blood flow, and then there's also a hemorrhagic stroke, which is a bleed, typically because of... Uh, uh, high blood pressure or a congenital issue. Uh, in terms of DMT, the the data or the research that we have is based on uh, a stroke model for ischemic. And uh, so we're not sure at the moment if uh, DMT can help the, a patient that has had a hemorrhagic stroke. And uh, we'll, we'll know that a little more when we uh, conduct our preclinical research uh, program, but the so the the data is is there showing in fact it's helpful for the ischemic stroke patient. We're not sure about the hemorrhagic patient. Well, one of the challenges, and we were talking uh, you and I and David before we started, is that uh, when you have a stroke, um, until the your physicians know whether you've had either a blockage or a bleed, they really can't treat you, and that can't happen until you've had a CT scan. And so uh, as a result, only about 10% of patients get a TPA, which is a, a clot-busting drug, and only 5% respond. So um, there, there's, there's, uh, there, there's an important area, an unmet need here, and we hope DMT can help uh, stroke patients. Now, Dr. Nutt, I know that you have been uh, studying psychedelics for a, a good part of your career. What did you think when Algernon approached you and said, we want you to be a consultant on our team as we look at DMT and in, in the treatment of stroke? Yeah, I, yeah. I thought, damn, I wish I thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a psychiatrist. I'm not supposed to think about neurological things. No, I thought, what a clever idea. Then I said to him, but the problem is, Stroke patients are often delirious anyway, so giving them DMT and giving them a trip could make things worse. They could be very hard to manage. And he pointed out that they were going to be using a sub-psychedelic dose, a dose which we think will stimulate the receptors enough to, to make them do one of the things they do, which is regrow parts of the neuron, but not enough to disturb the equilibrium of the brain so they, it won't produce a psychedelic state, which would be distressing for patients. Definitely. Now, Chris, is there preliminary data that shows that this can definitely help repair the brain? Well, there, there's uh, there's two key studies. One was done by Olson in in vitro, which uh, showed that, uh, uh, and he was testing uh, DMT as well as LSD, showing that uh, when exposed to uh, uh, neurons, uh, cortical neurons, the cells showed neuroplasticity. These growths on the called dendritic spines. And uh, so that was quite uh, quite compelling. The data is very strong. And then an additional study that he did in vivo showed that the sub-psychedelic dose was effective in reducing depression in his animal study. And then the third study was done by Nagy et al. in Hungary. They did a rat model for ischemic stroke and showed that uh, in 30 days, uh, the, there was a dramatic uh, decrease in the infarct volume, the area of dead cells in the brain, and also motor function was greatly improved. So those were the key studies. Uh, we looked at Rick Strassman's study from the 90s showing what the maximum uh, dose was in terms of, I think it's around 0.6 milligrams per kilogram, and then they looked at what the minimal dose was for that psychedelic experience. And as, as Dr. Nutt said, I think if you've had a stroke, it's pretty common sense that you don't want to be sending somebody off on a, on a paradigm shift. And, and we're not making any judgments as a company about the benefits of, of the psychedelic dose of DMT. We, we simply looked at this from a pure pharma perspective, um, looking at DMT, establishing new intellectual property, and then what's the best path to, uh, to treat patients uh, that have had a stroke either shortly thereafter or possibly even when they're in a rehabilitation program. 
Dr. Nutt, with so many governments looking at DMT as a Schedule One drug, what, what kind of challenges do researchers face when studying this drug? And do you think that the tide is starting to shift a little bit? Well, the challenges are enormous. The bureaucracy around working with Schedule One drugs is vast, and you have to comply with it all, otherwise you risk going to prison. Uh, but the tide is turning, and, and the most dramatic uh, evidence for that was the Oregon vote in November, when Oregon voted to make magic mushrooms, which is a, 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 the, the mushroom that makes psilocybin, another uh, hallucinogen, um, legal and uh, or at least decriminalized, and also they're going to put it into programs for depression. So, so I think the tide is turning because the science is showing that these drugs have enormous therapeutic potential and they are not dangerous. The reason they were put into Schedule One back in 1967 was because the CIA thought they were provoking the anti-war movement. You know, and the evidence of harm was trivial then, and and it's certainly there's you know now we know that they're one of the most probably the safe some of the safest drugs we have. And Chris, do you anticipate that Algernon will be able to drive your stroke program as quickly as you have some of your other clinical programs that you have going on right now? I, I think so, and and we we sort of looked at it in in modules. The first module is um, we need a supply of uh, CGMP, which is clinical grade. API and finished product to put into man or to do your clinical study. So we recently, we decided we're not going to try to harvest it. Uh, you know, if you want to take a, a, a real pharma play, you've got to have a safe, stable uh, supply of your active ingredient. You have to be able to produce quantities, kilogram quantities, so that you can produce your finished product. So we recently appointed Dalton Pharma Services from Canada they are a, a manufacturer. They have produced uh, psilocybin, psilocin. They have all the regulatory permits and licenses. So that was step one. We recently announced that we had retained Charles River Laboratories to conduct our preclinical research. Preclinical meaning uh, not human or animal uh, uh, and or cells. And uh, they're going to conduct that research in Finland where they have a lab that's licensed, has the capacity to to take receipt of uh, the uh, of DMT, and and we're very close to making our announcement on where we're going to run our phase one study, and that would be with an institution as well. We want to reduce risk as a company, so I don't like the uncertainty of well, maybe we could do it in Australia. We looked. There's a 40% refundable tax credit in Australia. We like Australia. We we're running a phase two trial there, but it as David knows. Uh, it's, it's not open everywhere globally. In fact, uh, we went to one of our Chinese manufacturers for, they said it's absolutely forbidden. You cannot produce that uh, drug in, in China. So likely we're going to stick with true and tried um, where they have the uh, um, permits, licenses in place. Elgernon won't be handling the material, so we don't have to be licensed. Mm. And that reduces a lot of the regulatory stress that, you know, David's been sort of fighting against uh, all these years to open open that up because as David said if you're restricting it for people you're going to restrict it for scientists and that's what happened how soon literature but we also want to confirm what that maximum dose that's sub psychedelic and it may be variable in certain either people or in the population so it's not just weight we have to figure that out um, and so but that's really safety and dosing we also need to understand we're going to deliver DMT intravenously not with a bolus dose but continuous and is that for one hour, three hours, six hours, 12 hours? Where do we see the maximum benefit that will be uncovered in that phase one study? Once the phase one study is done and we've written our protocol for the phase two, we're actually going to go after two areas. One is acute treatment as soon as the insult occurs or as soon as possible. Hopefully it's not uh, showing negative impact on the hemorrhagic patient. There is a bit of an increase with DMT in terms of blood pressure. We might be able to mitigate that with channel blockers that lower the blood pressure. We have to see if you're raising blood pressure and someone has a hemorrhagic stroke, it could be fatal. And then the uh, the other is um, 
Another exciting area in that is, can we help people who need rehabilitation? After 24 hours, there's not much for stroke patients except prayer. And to us, that's really uh, difficult to swallow. But if 85% of stroke patients have some deficit and uh, that can last for a period, can DMT help the brain rewire to reduce the um, sort of the deficits, what people are suffering from either speech or mo uh, uh, movement? I mean, this is a very exciting area. And uh, again, uh, Dr. Nutt's been spending uh, his life basically studying the most challenging organ in the brain, in the body, and that's the brain. And, and we're hoping to open this up with DMT. Uh, Dr. Nutt, could you tell us what differentiates uh, DMT from LSD or psilocybin? What what makes it different? Uh, well, the, the, in terms of this uh, direction of research, it's the fact that it doesn't stay in the body very long. So the really clever thing is you can infuse it till you get to the concentration you want. You can hold it there at a steady state level for as long as you like, hours, days. As soon as you switch off the pump, it's gone. So you don't, if you were to do that with LSD, you'd have to wait a day before it's gone. And with psilocybin, you'd have to wait six or eight hours. So it's, it's the fact that you can turn it on and off really um, almost immediately that makes DNT particularly uh, uh, appealing for this kind of uh, novel intervention. Of course, we welcome uh, our viewers to ask questions, and they are. Uh, Ryan says, how does dosage control work? Is it individualized per each subject, or is there a broad standard baseline? Well, this is what we're going to find out. Should I take this, Chris? So this no, this is a, a great question. And we have been thinking a lot about this in relation to all the psychedelics we use. And now, of course, if you're using a psychedelic dose, what you can, you know, we can we used to titrate the dose up till we got a psychedelic effect. But how are you, how are you going to look at a sub psychedelic effect? How are you going to work out what the, the uh, a functional dose will be that isn't homeopathic? And one of the things we're going to do in the phase one study is we're going to use EEG. So recording brain waves is a very sensitive measure of the effect of the, these drugs on the receptors in the brain. So what we're thinking is you will be able to increase the dose up, up and up, it's, you know, in, in obviously in stages in different people until we get to a, a dose which starts to perturb the, the, the brain waves. Uh, and that will be a, a, a sub psychedelic dose, we're almost certain. And at that level we can stop because if we pushed it up any more then we would get the psychedelic effect. Are you trying to get brain cells to regenerate? I mean, what what is the ultimate goal here? So you don't. So what? Or we can know, that even be, happen? Well, yeah. I mean, it's that's a tough. I mean, there are the brain can make new brain cells, but it only in one or two specialist parts of the brain, and that, and it can't make very many. But what we can do is heal dam damaged cells. So, but there are two parts of a stroke. There's the bit that's dead when the you know it just dies because like a heart attack you know a bit of the tissue a bit of the brain dies because it doesn't get enough oxygen but then as it dies it the cells release toxins which which damage and eventually kill other cells so what you're targeting are the cells which are being damaged by these toxins from the the dead cells and the the great thing about the receptors that the dmt works on is that they are they kind of heal the but they, they produce um what we call Plasticity, they allow the bits of the brain to grow, bits of the neurons to grow. So you can stabilize a damaged neuron and hopefully then allow it to restore itself. So uh, and neurons are a bit like trees. And, um, and you know, in winter or after a stroke, you know, you, they lose a lot of their leaves, a lot of their capacity to function. But we're hoping that DMT will then put back that ability to grow the leaves again, fresh, like in the, in the spring. Let's hope, let's hope.